Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, HII's uh, sponsored discussion today on CJADC2, Combined Joint All Domain Command and Control. It's uh, terrific to have you here today. Uh, I have the uh, dubious honor of being the moderator of this very august panel, and I gotta tell you, I've got the least IQ of anybody on this table. So, you know, looking at uh, Vice Admiral Thomas, uh, an old friend, uh, uh, Doug Small, uh, uh, Dennis Crawl from the Marine Corps, Lieutenant General, former J-6, uh, Punch Moulton, my battle buddy from J-3, and Gary Schwartz uh, from Mission Systems at HII. We've got a jam-packed uh, group of subject matter experts here this morning. And the challenge is, two, one, for me to try to keep up with these big brains, and two, to try to get this all done in an hour and leave some time for uh, questions and answers because I know you have things that you would like to ask. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank HII. I, I am not an employee of HII. They are sponsors of the Navy League. Uh, they're very generous. I want to uh, laud them for doing this uh, through mission systems. So many weapon systems out there. We just had an incredible successful deployment of uh, the carrier strike group uh, USS Ford and that ship really proved its uh, metal on its first real deployment overseas and extended. Um, you know, one of the ambassadors, I know Jim Jeffries, many of you may know him, said that uh, ship's presence in the Eastern Med probably prevented Hezbollah's attacking Israel on another flank, and that is just uh, absolutely fantastic, and I believe what uh, Jim is telling me. So without any further ado, uh, we'll get going with this infamous acronym, which stands for, and I'm going to turn my phone off so it doesn't interfere with anything here, uh, stands for Combined Joint All Domain Command and Control. Uh, two years ago, um, I was asked by the National Academy of Sciences to participate in a Naval Information Warfare Center West, NIWIC West seminar in San Diego, hosted by one of our panelists, Admiral Doug Small. Uh, Doug's an 88 graduate of Marquette University. He's a bachelor's in physics. He also has a PhD in physics from the Naval Postgraduate School. So really smart guy. He's got uh, a, a, an inordinate amount of operational tours, but since uh, 1997, he converted to engineering duty officer. His first flag assignment was integrated warfare systems for PEO IWS, and he assumed command of Naval Information Warfare Systems in August 2020. I'm gonna go fast because I'm gonna work through all these guys. Uh, just before I arrived at NIWIC, Admiral Mike Gilday, a uh, good friend, and I think he's out there uh, roaming around at sea airspace, uh, told Doug to come up with uh, the Navy's contribution to CJADC2. The headlines read, this will be the Navy's Manhattan Project. And here's how he summarized his tasking to Doug. He said, develop networks, infrastructure, data, architecture, tools, and analytics that support the operational and developmental environment that will enable our sustained maritime dominance, AKA Project Overmatch. And he also said this was the Navy's top priority next to the Columbia-class ballistic missile submarine for uh, the most survivable part of the triad in, uh, in nuclear deterrence, very close to my heart. And uh, each of the services, that, as you know, have been designing or developing their own contribution to CJADC2. For us, Overmatch, for the Army and the Marine Corps, Convergence, uh, for the Air Force, Advanced Battle Management System, and yes, the Space Force has national defense space architecture as well. So a lot of different uh, tool sets floating around out there. Admiral Gilday also tasked uh, Admiral Kildee, Kildee, or, sorry, Kilby, uh, to develop a coherent kill chain that would allow any sensor to take on any shooter and destroy the enemy. So a sensor package could be passed to a shipper platform with a missile to kill it. It could be an Air Force sensor, a Navy missile, a Navy sensor, an Air Force missile. So I think that's pretty cool. And the idea was to spread the force out through our current doctrine of distributed maritime operations, a network force that would connect all these various shooters together in order to find, fix, and finish the enemy. So, uh, you know, this is eerily reminiscent of something that I'll be talking about tomorrow with the author of Ghost Fleet, Peter Singer. Now, Peter's written a ton of books. One of them, probably one of the first most uh, notable was Wired for War. And in Wired for War, he brought up, uh, or he wrote a chapter called The Big Zabrowski and the Real Revolution in Military Affairs. So you remember the movie, The Big Lebowski, that was about John Goodman. The Big Zabrowski was about Art Zabrowski, who 
I, I hold in high regard, uh, you know, rest in peace. But Art Zabrowski was president of Naval War College uh, in 1998, and he wrote a piece in Proceedings entitled Network-Centric Warfare, Its Origin and Future. The vision was perfect situational awareness that would enable informed decisions and decision superiority in the battle space. Unfortunately, God took them away from us 20 years ago, and then we got our boots and our heads in the sands of Iraq and Afghanistan and the global war on terror, and our adversaries started to move past us on cyberspace and information technology and, and uh, AI. So we're playing catch up. Now, Doug, you've been uh, quietly working on Overmatch for over two years, and I suspect uh, that since it's been called the Navy's Manhattan Project, that makes you Robert Oppenheimer. So we're gonna ask you some questions about it. Fonz Boyle, the third fleet commander, rolled out a press conference a few weeks ago and he talked about Overmatch is here. It's out on three carrier strike groups. And we're not just experimenting for the sake of experimenting. And I quote Boyle, this is proving that we can connect, that I can connect to a Patriot battery, army system, and that I can connect across the joint force. I can connect through a tactical operations center light to the Air Force and Air Force sensors that bring information in. So Doug, First question, how does it feel to be the next Robert Oppenheimer and is Overmatch gonna win as many Oscars as Killian Murphy did in uh, Hollywood recently? No, in all seriousness, uh, tell us about this journey over the last few years. How's it been going for you? Um, wow, thank you. Um, it's been going, um, it's been going. That's, that's really the key, right? Is we have focused on actually delivering capability. Um, focused on, you know, certainly the delivery, but also the training, developing of the con ops, you know, how do you use this um, stuff? You highlighted what, what it is, this uh, naval operational architecture does reflect a pivot from things like, um, you know, the, the um, war on terror stuff that we were doing to uh, more modern uh, adversary in a denied environment and really getting at you know, those components of the architecture, the networking, the uh, tools and analytics, data fabrics, and then all the infrastructure that, that allows you to move at speed and scale. So it's been, it's been, um, it's been going fairly well. So we are ahead of the, pl the objectives that the CNO laid out for us in terms of numbers of systems, as well as, you know, the, the world of technology has changed even since he stood it up. And because we've been able to stay agile, we've been able to take on new things as they come in and make sure that they get plugged into the architecture. The, um, the discussion that you helped us lead was all about how do you measure decision advantage? This, this concept that you brought up from, you know, Admiral Soprowski, you know, how, how do you, you know, we talk about decision advantage all the time, but how do you actually measure it? How do you determine what that means? And we came up with, you know, making decisions better and faster than the adversary, but then critically, disseminating that decision and that gets into the, sort of the lightning bolts piece of making sure that whether it's a track or an order from a fleet commander that it can get to where it needs to go um, is an absolutely critical part of that. So we have been delivering, we've been focused on delivering, been focused on starting with what we have, bringing some, some fairly critical but mature technologies to be, be able to build on what we have and that's how you get to fast tracking and speed is you don't, you're not waiting for the next big thing, you're, you're delivering um, based on what you have. Did I get it right that it's really about the network and connecting any sensor to any shooter uh, to achieve this decision superiority in the battle space? And have you, have you able, been able to demonstrate that? Things have been kind of quiet on this front. I realize classification issues and this is an unclassed forum, but what can you tell us about that? So I, I'd say it's, you know, um, I usually try to stay away from the discussion on any sensor to any shooter, um, just because it's really it's really more about you know are you actually Admiral Admiral Thomas can speak much more eloquently about this than I can, but you know how does a, a commander at whatever level sense their battle space and then see to the forces that are assigned to them, whether that information needs to flow to a weapon or to a human to make a decision. That's that's really the that's an important point. The, the right point. It's not just to a, a machine, right? Exactly. There still is a man or a person machine interface. That's, that's right. The right sensor and the right shooter. And the right yeah. That might be a better way to put it. Yeah, I think that's 
very appropriate, uh, Carl, if I may call you Carl, and we go back a long ways, but uh, the temporal aspect of this thing is really important. So you want to hold your cards close until you have that advantage and you can take that advantage. And the whole goal is to surprise the adversary, right? Exactly. How about, uh, can you elaborate any on uh, Vice Admiral Boyle's announcement? I mean, you said three carrier strike groups. Uh, sorry, I can't tell you which ones. Uh, I mean, are we divided East Coast, West Coast? Can you say anything about that? And, uh, you know, where exactly, where exactly are we on the timeline of deployment of this uh, system overmatch in the fleet? So I, I would say, you know, we're ahead of the timeline that CNO laid out in the NAV plan and, um, and that you know, CNO Franchetti has been clear that we're still executing to. Uh, we're ahead of that. As far as the exact numbers, I, you know, I won't, won't talk to that, but it's, and it's more than strike groups. It's also at, you know, fleets and um, numbered fleets. And, and uh, so certainly afloat and ashore. Um, we're, we're, we continue to be ahead. Yeah, we were talking on the phone last week. You mentioned, hey, um, you know, I'm doing my part, and it's a huge part. It is a Manhattan Project-like uh, thing in Overmatch. Um, and where, you know, your part stops is kind of the lateral of the handoff to that, uh, that runner that's heading downfield to make this truly uh, combined and joint. And so he said, uh, you know, you could use a little uh, assistance with that. And that's why we've got the rest of the, the speakers on the stage today. So we'll get to that, but you've also got, look at, I mean, standing room only here in the room. So industry is here, Doug. What help do you need from them? I'm sure they're looking, for, you're all looking for a demand signal? There you go. So uh, we've been pretty consistent and, uh, and had many uh, industry days to include uh, at all levels of classification and with the Air Force. By the way, kudos to you because several people mentioned that to me coming in here and said your industry days are phenomenal. I'm sure they'd all like to know how to get in. I'm, you probably have to be, you got to have a pretty high clearance, but. Uh. It, it depends on which one. Some of them are, some of them are Genser, some of them, you know, just Genser secrets. Some of them have been um, SCI with the Air Force directly. So. My, my biggest ask is just um, be software centric. You know, again, part of moving fast is if you're fielding software on existing um, hardware, that's, that is the fastest way to move. And so that's, that has been our mantra is just focus on software, whether it's software defined networking, software based, you know, battle management aids and, and um, what we call the tools and analytics, um, data tools, um, you know, we're fielding a, a data fabric that connects across the force. All of those things we provide as a platform, what we need are the applications, not new, new computers. Um, that just takes longer to install on, on ships and, and shore facilities. So focus on software is our key thing. We have plenty of contract vehicles to get your software into the you know, brains of sailors tomorrow. Um, just work with us on that. And that's part of the infrastructure stuff that we've set up is end-to-end -end dev suck ops to include, um, you know, moving software over the air to ships at sea. So this is, this is the way we do business. That's my biggest ask. And you know, yeah, and you know what's beautiful about that is tomorrow we've got, uh, I've got uh, the Honorable ASNRDA, uh, Mr. Nicholas Gurdon on the stage, and in talking to Spanky Morley and to uh, uh, the Secretary himself, you know, one of the questions, uh, that I was asked, you know, can, can you fit this in, is about the uh, Assistant Secretary's time at Carnegie Mellon University. And he worked on software reliant and resilient systems and agile. So it dovetails beautifully with what you're doing. And you're nodding your head, so I'm sure you've had conversations with him. So we'll get a little bit of that tomorrow, as well as a lot about hearing from ASN at RDA on how we're doing on uh, acquisition and shipbuilding. All right, Doug, thanks so much. Uh, we put you on the spot up front, and uh, there is no uh, protocol order here, so I'm going a little out of order, but I'm going where I think I need to go in uh, line with the discussion. I'm gonna shift to uh, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Dennis Crawl, United States Marine Corps, retired career aviation command and control officer and a highly decorated combat veteran. Dennis, thanks for coming today. He is uh, also CEO of Advanced Foundry LLC, and a renowned CJAD C2 subject matter expert, having been assigned the portfolio while serving as the Joint Staff J6. Uh, his team was responsible for the publication of the DOD 
CJADC2 strategy, signed by SECDEF, the posture review, and the implementation plan. And finally, he led a cross-functional team to ensure the services had a venue for best use cases, technology solutions, and implementation progress. So Dennis, on the big picture on CJADC2, we just heard what the Navy is doing with Overmatch. Now we're gonna talk about integration. So here's my question. Exactly what is CJADC2 in the most basic terms? Why is it critical to the modern warfight? Why has CJADC2 implementation been so challenging? Who's the responsible officer? And what are the consequences for noncompliance? And Jeff Trussler is sitting in the front row. Jeff stayed up all night last night sending me emails to prepare me for this thing, because remember, I've got the lowest IQ in the room. And Jeff said, you can, you can call me out and you can use my name. And he said, how can we realistically achieve CJADC2 with our closest Indo-PACOM allies when our own policies prevent integration? So Dennis, loaded bunch of questions there. What do you have to say about all that? Well, hopefully we've uh, overcome the technology challenges here. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, a couple things. Uh, one, that sounds like the opening to a court martial uh, with <laughs> 17 questions loaded together. Uh, Break or more. But, yeah. uh, but easy, to, easy to package. So maybe we start with the idea of a working definition of CJADC2. We all use it. Very few people, I think, even understand it. Uh, it's two areas that I think I would, I would have you think about. Uh, the first is the obvious, that we're awash in data. Uh, data is everywhere. Uh, if you go back 20 or 30 years, there was a way to manage that data. It's largely unmanageable at this point. Even sensors that were not designed to collect in a way that we're using them uh, have matured rapidly and data amalgamated can provide a picture or insight in ways I don't think anyone has even thought of. Uh, in the future, the third part of this is gonna be data availability, but we'll leave that off to the side. So on one side of the scale, you have a vast amount of data, and data are the coin uh, of this realm now. Uh, and so you've got that sitting on one side of the scale, and if that was the only problem we had, you wouldn't need CJADC2. You could take your time to go through this, make sense of it, and then act. The challenge is on the other side of the scale, which competes against, against this, and that is the speed of decision making. It has shrunk. So when we start looking at the ability and our reliance on data to make decisions, whether it be, you know, we talked about sensor to shooter, but JADC2 is much bigger uh, than sensor to shooter. It's about moving logistics. It's about moving medical uh, supplies. It's about moving medical information. Anything that involves war fighting projection and readiness fits the same equation. And so you have data, too much to manage, and speed, which is reduced to a point that you know maybe it was weeks, days, now minutes, seconds, and with hypersonics, milliseconds. These two things have collided, which is why you need to be able to move data at speed, we need to make sense of it quickly, and then most importantly, you have to project it and act, uh, which is why some of the more parochial ideas of uh, transport layer and uh, traditional command and control is so important. What good is it to know the right decision but not be able to get it to the warfighter at the tactical edge to act on it? Uh, so that is the, uh, the crux of the JADC2 argument. And the best uh, aspect of the acronym are the first two letters. The fact that there's a C and a J change the way that we do business. It's not good enough for services to solve what they think are the, uh, the rest of the acronym, the all domain command and control or add C2 pieces for themselves. It has to, we're never gonna fight alone. We're gonna fight uh, in a combined joint arena. And so the solutions have to port and they can't do it after the fact. If we build grand things, and then try and back our way into the joint combined arena, these will either fail on their, on their face or they'll be too expensive to manipulate after the fact. Gone are the days of building Rosetta Stones between software, which is a whole cottage industry for some. Uh, taking things that don't work and after the fact trying to kludge them together 
We have software today that we field, modern software, that has no way for the data to come out. No APIs, no interface that makes sense. And after the fact, trying to build those is very difficult. So why is it so hard to do? Uh, lack of an understanding of what's required from the beginning. The services can't decide that. That has to be done through OSD. That has to be done through ANS. That has to be done through other aspects of government uh, in the Department of Defense. And I say standards with a little s, not standards with the big s. There has to be some freedom in design and development. But everyone needs to know what a three-pronged plug looks like, and they'll build to it. And in the absence of that guidance, they'll build whatever they think is right. And then we'll realize how difficult it is to make these things work together. So we have years and years and years of history of failed trials. And the prognosis is, I think, the language, in my estimation, of working JADC2 for 10 years, is we finally have the words. And if there were solace in words, would be done. But the actions now that flow from those words, while I'm optimistic and excited, is really where that challenge is. I'd take the Manhattan Project over this one. I think the Manhattan Project's easier. Uh, this is going to require a level of cooperation. It's going to require a level of partnership with industry we've never had. And frankly, it's going to require industry to listen. And, I, and I'm speaking very frankly. Uh, I love working with industry. I'm part of it now to some degree. Uh, but we have very unique needs. And reaching on the shelf and grabbing something and employing it uh, that doesn't match what we're asking for is not going to work any longer. They'll be very short-lived. So at least I've answered three of those uh, out of the round of 27, I think it was. All right. We're, uh, we're going to get back to that integration piece here in a minute. And I live the nightmare Jeff Trussler talked about where it was really hard just to get uh, Cipernet to allies and partners, uh, even in times where we were uh, shooting missiles together into places like Syrian chemical weapon sites or you know, some French uh, frigate was doing air cover for our carrier in the Eastern Med. All right, um, shifting gears, I'm gonna go to Vice Admiral Carl Thomas, a native of Northern Virginia like me. So uh, I joined the Navy, left for 40 years and came back. And so did you. Uh, he received his commission from Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps at Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute in 1986. His degree is in management systems. Uh, he has a master's degree uh, in information technology from the Naval Postgraduate School. And they'll be with us on the days for our war gaming session uh, later today, too. Uh, his lovely wife, Jennifer, is outside. I got to meet her back when Carl and I worked at Naval Reactors in 2001 to 2003 for Admiral Skip Bowman. I just saw Skip last week at Admiral Franchetti's retired four star. He's in rare form. His golf game and handicap are really good, Carl. You helped him out with that. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, uh, as EA to aide de camp, uh, that, was a, that was a tough haul. That was a tough couple of years. Uh, there were uh, four yellow footprints in front of the Admiral's desk, two for me and two for Carl. And when things weren't going well in the nuclear Navy, we got called in. Stand there, gentlemen. And, uh, and we heard about it. And then we went off to try to fix it. We considers, considered ourselves, for you nukes out there, Carl and I were the primary containment. Uh, we had to keep the core covered at all times. And the line locker had the easy job. They were the secondary containment. They were divorced by one floor and a lot of distance uh, from the boss. But the boss was brilliant. I mean, he used to have a, a state of uh, uh, the union address every year, and he'd work for countless weeks on this thing and then come up with a plan. So he had a... He had an eight-year plan, you know, eight years, long time. And every year, he developed and modified that plan to go into the next year and the next. And he really did a lot of great things in naval reactors, so loved my time with him. He also uh, had an eye as a former chief of naval personnel for talent and talent management. And you were a lieutenant commander then, right? Did you, would you start as a lieutenant? can't remember. Lieutenant commander, yeah. So the aide was an LCDR. I was an 06. And the boss used to ask me, he goes, you know, for an aviator, Carl's really smart. Why didn't, he go, why didn't he go nuclear power? I don't know, sir, but he'll have a chance. And so he earmarked you uh, to be a nuke. And in fact, that's what you did. So Admiral Thomas started off as a, a E2C Hawkeye Naval Aviator, uh, but he had uh, command XO and command of VAW-117 during Operation Iraqi Freedom. He saw combat operations. 
And he also commanded my favorite ship in the United States Navy, because after becoming a nuke, how hard was that to go to nuke school and relearn all this stuff? Then he commanded the deep draft USS Mount Whitney. I love that ship. If the Navy ever does away with it, I'm going to be very upset. Um, he had Abraham Lincoln during a complex refueling overhaul. So they don't put nukes like me on refueling overhauls. They put nukes like Carl on refueling overhauls. And then his reward after that grueling overhaul was to go out and command USS Carl Vinson CVN-70 on deployment. Uh, most recently, he was the commander of 7th Fleet, facing the bad guys eye to eye out in the Western Pacific and the South China Sea. And he did that job from July 2021 to February 2024, and now he's back as the uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare N2 and 6, relieved a great guy uh, in JT here in the front row, 69th Director of Naval Intelligence. So, Carl. You have incredible command experience. Uh, you've done a lot of things. You've been a squadron commander, uh, you commanded Mount Whitney, two carriers, carrier strike group, and a numbered fleet. But when you started out in this business of flying the E-2, uh, it was well before CJAD C-2 came to fruition. And I recall as sixth fleet commander, uh, bringing the theater Roosevelt into my theater, uh, my friend and, and a great guy, uh, Admiral Woody Lewis, was a newly minted one star at the time. He was the strike group commander. And he was the first person, first strike group commander to deploy with NIFCA, Naval Integrated Fires Counter Air. And at the time, and a lot of these guys are retired now, not so much uh, Woody, but a lot of the senior leadership of the Navy was like, hey, you know, we don't need this JADC2 stuff. I mean, we got NIFCA. I mean, we invented it. So now the other services are catching up with us. Do you subscribe to that? Um, let, me, let me start by uh, saying that I'm going to took my opening line here with a, a focus as the Seventh Fleet Commander coming into gear. Uh, I had a chance to, to sail in the Pacific and to, to stare the adversary in the face every day, uh, competition, uh, deterring the adversary. And the letters that, uh, that you spelled out, the C, the J, I was going to give the A, D a, a, a bone as well. Uh, we're looking at an adversary that's going to take a combined fight. It's a joint fight. It's an all-domain fight. And so to get to, to the Admiral's question about uh, NIFCA, I thought I'd uh, I'll share a little thought pattern through, uh, through history here. There's a few people in the room that uh, sailed out there when the Soviet Union uh, was still a thing. And we used to sail our aircraft carriers across the Aleutian Islands, and we'd uh, try to chuck and jive and hide from the bear box. Uh, we'd get close to the, uh, the coastline, and we had this tactic, technique, and procedure called vector logic and chainsaw. And it was a way that we were going to conduct the outer air battle by putting <coughs> F-14s out in a matrix in front of the uh, carrier strike group with KA-6s to refuel to provide that logistics. And the battle space was about 60 degrees and maybe out to six or 700 miles. And, uh, and you set that battle space for descent defense, and then you projected power in with your, your A-6s. And that was the fight back in the late 80s and the early 90s. Uh, and then we got smarter in this uh, technical capability of NIFCA, of integrating our sensors to be able to make what was a, a one domain fight, really an air domain fight, a two domain fight, uh, surface and air, where we integrated our fire controls to be able to shoot on each other's uh, sensor information. And, uh, and so now we expanded the battle space. And that, and that worked for a while. Uh, and now the battle space is just so much broader. And it's all the way from the seabed to space. And it has other domains like cyber. And the information flow that Dennis talked about and the data that's out there, it's about making sense of all that data in a speed-relevant manner and get inside. You know, it's the old OODA loop, the John Boyd OODA loop of observing and orienting and deciding and acting, but at a much higher rate. And uh, the good thing is that the battle space is, is large, so there's a lot of maneuver space in that battle space, but it also means that the fires have to be extended and then uh, and you have to work uh, you know, have to work in a coherent fashion across all domains with not only our service brethren, but also with our combined partners. And, it's, and that's a tremendously important thing as you, uh, as the Marines work to be the inside force, as the Army's looking at the uh, MDTF capabilities, and you blend the inside and the outside, and you uh, you move and coordinate. 
Uh, that ability to get that C2 across, the last two letters of C, J, C2, uh, is really important. And, uh, and you need to do it not only across the folks that are at the tactical edge, but up through the operational centers, whether it's a, a maritime operations center, an air operations center. You have to be aligned in your thinking so that you can uh, move coherently and uh, fall back. And so that, that's the way I, I think we progress even beyond NIFCA. NIFCA is a capability, yeah. but, but we're now looking at how do you understand what's happening and synchronize your, your effects. What do you think about JT's question or constructive criticism on integration? You know, um, I mean, we, we kicked around a couple of emails about Cipernet, but across IPC, allies and partners, got a lot of allies and partners here. Um, if we're being challenged right now in getting to the C and the J part of this, then uh, what's gonna happen for interoperability with those folks we depend on? We're never going to a fight again unless there's a coalition or an alliance, right? Yeah, I mean, I can give real world examples. You know, we've, yeah. had, we've been very fortunate to have uh, Queen Elizabeth come over with some of our European allies uh, making up that strike group, a great uh, multilateral demonstration of unity. We don't have a NATO over in the Western Pacific. And so yeah. having NATO countries come over and sail on the Seventh Fleet AOR, extremely important. Uh, we do pretty well in, in uh, the European theater with systems like BICES and the uh, OPTAS that we train and operate together, but then you get over into the Western Pacific and we have Centrix and other systems. Mm -hmm. And so we're working on that. We're working on how do we, uh, you know, there's a sharing, there's an information security piece to this. That's something we have to, we have to solve, because you're right, we're not gonna fight alone. Uh, hopefully we're not gonna fight. Hopefully the adversary will recognize that it's, a, it's not a 1v1 or a 1v2, it's a 1v many. Yeah. And, uh, and being able to synchronize and be on the same page is just escalate. It's exponential challenges if you bring that into it. Yeah, and our success in CJAD C2 is really a deterrent. It's like uh, the, the Columbia class, right? Because if the adversary understands that his decision calculus is based on, you know, less, as Admiral Rich Meese used to tell me, if you're, you're in a fight in a submarine on submarine and you got a, at least a 50% chance of uh, winning that fight, take it. But if it's less than 50%, go away, come back another day. And I think that's the way the Chinese think too. And Putin, you know, he hasn't attacked NATO yet because he knows he can't win that war. So if we've got decision superiority, it makes, hard, makes it hard for them uh, to commit to kinetic operations or something like the invasion of Taiwan. Well, excellent, thanks Carl. You took away my uh, second question because you talked about real world examples as a fleet commander. Uh, I'm proud of you <clears throat> from those days we spent together as a lieutenant commander. I live vicariously through guys like you, and I'm glad you're back. But now you're back in the Pentagon, and JT's old job is N2, N6. Um, what can you do in this new position? And, you know, we didn't all, normally we had uh, intel officers in this job. Now we've taken a warfighter out of the field and put them in there, like, like you and Jeff. What can you do to facilitate further progress in CJAD C2 from your position as N2 N6? Yeah, I think the, the information warfare, quite frankly, is in every one of our communities. I'm really proud that we're, we're treating information warfare as it's uh, as a, a complementary warfare domain, but it also is embedded in everything we do. And so uh, from the N2 6 job, clearly in my portfolio, there's an awful lot of opportunity to work on that interoperability, to work on the tactical systems, the national command systems, um, and I you know, it was the first week of the job. I was in a CJAC two meeting, uh, working with the joint partners and on how we're going to drive it forward. And, and I've been to several uh, long range fires meetings as well. So I think the portfolio is is ripe. Uh, I think the benefit of having been out there on the front line it, it brings back what we're able to do and where we need to go. And so that that's I see the best value of, of me being in this job is to take uh, what I was staring at before the last six years. And, and really help to drive, and I'm glad to have smarter yeah. people than me, like Jim Smalls, that are, that are working. PhD in physics, yeah. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so to go until I'd like to go to questions from the audience and two more speakers. So <clears throat> I'll shift now to Major General Punch Moulton. Uh, Punch is not only a friend, but he's the <clears throat> Vice President of Stellar Advisors at Stellar Solutions Incorporated out in Colorado. He leads a team of senior leader consultants tackling challenges and delivering expertise across a broad portfolio, including cyberspace, missile defense, warfighter support, international defense, and commercial strategy. 
And prior to joining Stellar in uh, 2012, it's hard to believe it's been a dozen years, Punch, you still look good. Uh, he was Major General in the United States Air Force and he was the Director of Operations J3 at United States European Command with Admiral Stavridis. So we knew each other when I worked for Stav and we knew each other when I went to Naples and we did uh, Joint Task Force Unified Protector in Libya. And that was quite a story we don't have time for today. Punch is a, a 33 year uh, a career in the Air Force, he flew the T-38 F-5, F-15. He's a fighter, fighter pilot. And, uh, you know, when uh, the Arab Spring broke out, he was my right-hand man and my wingman helping me out. When I went back as Sixth Fleet Commander and had a dual hat as Strike Force NATO and Commander of Sixth Fleet, Strike Force NATO is a NATO command in Lisbon, Portugal. It's responsible for the European phased adaptive approach of ballistic missile defense. And when the Secretary General of NATO said in the NAC, Strike Force NATO will be our repository and our principal command to execute uh, ballistic missile defense in Europe, I needed help. Nobody knew anything about this. I knew a little bit about it. I'm a submariner, you know, I'm not a destroyer sailor, but I learned a lot when I was in the uh, one star job. So I turned to punch. And he came out and he helped me out and he educated the team and he helped us set this up and it was extremely successful. So um, we could talk all day about BMD and how CJAD C2 can facilitate that, but uh, I wanna get on to uh, something else here. Last year at this venue, we had uh, Heidi Hsu, ddr &E, and uh, uh, the vice chairman, Chris Grady, come in and talk to us about Joint Warfighting Concept 3.0. So the current version, JWC 3.0, has four supporting concepts. Fires, information, logistics, and command and control. And Heidi Shu said uh, 3.0 is going to take joint warfighting uh, concepts and decompose them into capability needed for a highly contested fight. She's big into prototyping and likes rapid prototyping turning into experimentation and not just a laboratory, but a real exercise in a live environment. So get it out there to the fleet, test it. If you fail, it's okay. Go back, fix it, test it again. Admiral Franchetti, who was here this morning in a couple of different panels, I've heard her say many times, you know, she doesn't say the word exercise much. She says rehearsal, rehearsal of concept, because you never know when we're gonna be in a situation like we were in the Red Sea. I think Carney went through the Suez Canal on the 18th, she's shooting missiles on the 19th. <clears throat> so exercises become real world kinetic operations and we need to be able to rehearse that. So uh, Punch, here's the question. Uh, what are the biggest takeaways or lessons learned you'd like to pass on to the audience concerning C2 nodes, connectivity, data sharing, exploitation of the enemy's vulnerabilities? and Particularly, would you talk about something that came up in discussion last week, and that is GUIDE, G-I-D-E. We're not doing acronyms today, so I'll spell it out for you. Global Information Dominance Experiment. How does that fit into CJAD C2? And how does the new CDEO office, the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office, headed by Dr. Craig Martell and my friend Margie Palmieri, I didn't know she was there until I did the research. How does that all fit into this bigger, broader picture of CJAD C2. Sir, over to you. Oh, thanks. First of all, thanks for putting me on as the, the token member of the joint part of this panel. There you go. <laughs> Coming from the Air Force. Uh, I'm going to take you up a notch. So okay. there's an awful lot of talk about at the tactical and operational level guide global information dominance experiment uh, is actually aimed at the operational to strategics level. It, it, it originated with uh, General Van Herc out in NORAD and NORTHCOM. He had a vision that arguably would be, uh, I think, a, an evolution of the Sabrowski kind of thinking about network-centric warfare. His line was is that we need to have domain awareness, which will lead to information dominance, which will then empower decision superiority, and it has to be done in a global information, global environment where we're integrated. Uh, those four concepts all migrated together for him to then lead as a combatant commander a bunch of experiments that were frankly way out of his lane. But he was able to do guides 
Uh, we've just finished number nine. He sent, sent it over and uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks grabbed a hold of it in the guide six time frame, five, six. And, and she's now one of the biggest advocates along with the Vice Chairman, Admiral Grady. Uh, and, and the concept is to grab the information dominance to be able to give time for decision makers. And so the, the niche that they've grabbed onto, there's three mission threads, but the critical mission thread uh, is an acronym C5P. Don't worry about the, what that means. It, what it, I'm gonna describe it. It is the opportunity for, at the strategic level, we're in a competition phase, but a potential crisis is on the horizon. Generally, in today's world, we start asking for, the Secretary of Defense asks for combatant commanders to give commanders estimates. And those generally have to come in in about a week or maybe more time frame. What the effort of Guide 9 and, and all the previous guides is to be able to tackle the idea of let's deliver to the Secretary of Defense concepts that they can actually execute, COAs, if you will, um, in 24 hours that include all 11 combatant commands together that have collaborated in 24 hours and deliver a commander's estimate that is 11 combatant commands all seeing the same picture and seeing the same concept of ops with the possibility of two more COAs at the 48 hour point. And those COAs are empowered by being number one, feasible and number two, sustainable. In other words, the amount of delivery down inside of the data that is out there is extracted and exploited so that the COA is already delivered to the Secretary of Defense as being feasible and, su and sustainable. Uh, think about that from the perspective of today, the process is 11 independent combatant commanders may so deliver a commander's estimate and the Secretary actually is the integrating factor in the whole process. And that process actually is delivered at the integration is when RFFs come in from here and RFFs come in from there and there's not enough, the secretary splits the baby however he wants to do that and we end up with that is the collaborative effort that's out there. So this is a whole new concept and a whole new process. Um, and, and, what it, and I would tell you that uh, what's critical inside the CJAD C2 effort, by the way, is Deputy Secretary of Defense has said that this is the first operational capability of CJAD C2. Now, I've also seen in other news articles, well, this is the first operational capability, and that is and General Grinkowicz out in the Middle East has declared that is hungry hippo stuff that's going on right now is the first operational capability. But the point is the Deputy Secretary of Defense and Admiral Grady as the Vice Chairman are major advocates of this operational to strategic level thinking. Now, Guide is also doing two other mission threads. Uh, the other two mission threads, and we'll go into in much detail, but the first one is very much focused on the Indo-Pacific, and it's about maritime kill chain at scale, not at the onesies, twosies, but at thousands of targets um, to be able to be delivered. And then the third mission thread, it fits right back into the thought process of CJ in CJADC2, which is integrating partners. Now, the, the front edge of that is gonna probably be five I partners in this sequence, but it's also, and one that we often sort of gloss over, but the other part of the partnership is the interagency process that, that is, needs to be part of the integrated delivery of a COA that goes to the secretary that then goes to the president for decision processes. Uh, real quick, you asked another sort of, what are the thoughts, uh, let me, uh, let me channel uh, Brigadier General Cropsey, who was the Air Force's deliverer of command and control capabilities in the CJAD C2. Uh, he would tell you that one of the critical things we need to do is come to an agreement on the definitions. And as, as stated, the critical element here is, is that it depends on where you come from. I heard the, the a moment of, yeah, when I can now connect to a Patriot from the fleet, right? Uh, but how the Army sees command and control is entirely different than the way the Navy sees command and control, which inter interestingly enough is a blend, I would say, in the Air Force, which is not all the way to the Army, not all the way to the Navy, but sort of halfway in between. Uh, the, the, the secret is, is that 
as, as stated before, we've got to find a methodology that will help us, number one, connect, because if you fail to connect, then it doesn't make any difference where the data is. It's not going to work. Uh, number two, uh, once you do connect, uh, then you can uh, work with the data. But the third step is then to uh, exploit that data. Um, and, and it's that sequence that leads us to the industry statement, which says data is ubiquitous. It's not, owning data doesn't do you any good anymore. It's too much out there. What, it's what you do with the data and how you can exploit it that really matters. And I would tell you one of the secrets to GUIDE is that GUIDE is right now in an experimenting but trying to get right into that rehearsal mindset uh, that you mentioned, Jamie. Uh, the, the way that they are running the GUIDE experiment is they have the software developers literally in the event as it, and are modifying software as the event goes on. And, and so inside each scenario, they are developing. And I would argue that, for those who are familiar with the agile construct, that is probably what is needed a lot more as we go forward with CJADC2, which is get it in the hands of those who are gonna use it. The warfighter needs to see it, and then we can modify off of that as we see it. Now, arguably, what that ends up leading to is mission and requirement creep by a long shot, uh, and, and therefore that we need to be ready and mentally ready to do that, it requires an entirely different way to think about acquisition going forward. Um, uh, let me stop there for right okay. now and yep. let you go on. Thank you, Punch. So uh, our last speaker here today is Gary Schwartz, uh, HII Vice President, Chief Operating Officer for HII's Mission Technologies with 7,000 employees worldwide. Gary's got 40 years of serving national security missions in and out of uniform. He retired from the Marine Corps in 2004 with 21 years of service as both officer and enlisted. And I have to say, listening to Punch talk about guide, guide's really important. And uh, I've learned that in this, uh, in this process of preparing for today. Um, one of the things that HII did for the services was to provide uh, the live virtual conceptual piece for Large Scale Exercise 2023. And Scott Swift and I were part of that. Scott was head of the white cell, and believe it or not, never had an exercise with a white cell of over 1,800 people doing injects across 22 time zones and 25,000 personnel. I played the Secretary of Defense. And uh, the most important thing that came out of that for three component commanders was something they called gimmicks, the Global Maritime Commander's Sync. So just where Guide delivers 11 different COCOMs perspectives on what's going on in the world. We were able to do it across the maritime with three and it was very, very valuable. So there's a lot there. Uh, Gary, um, I want you to kind of take it home today and then we're gonna to go to Q&A. So uh, given your background in industry and familiarity with C5 ISR, what do you think we could be doing more of to help accelerate and operationalize CJAD C2? Thanks, Admiral. I appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to segue off of what uh, many of the panelists have talked about, but I'm going to pick a sweet spot and talk about the system of systems, system engineering aspects of this, that if you've been watching what's been going on in this program, have sort of been catching up to where the warfighters have been trying to drive things. And so uh, three things that I would recommend to try to accelerate. Uh, one is enterprise-wide distributed software factory. So there's lots of software factories out there. All the services have them. Many of them, to one extent or another, are supporting the CJADC2 concept. But we don't really have a fully integrated, continuously operating distributed federation of software factories, and that's a mouthful. Um, but what that allows you to be able to do is deal with any sets of problems at any particular time as the different capabilities are being experimented with, developed, and you can follow that agile approach that Punch talked to about continually providing a usable product, right? Um, and, and there's been some moves along that line. The CDAO office that Emma Fogo mentioned earlier, right? You know, in November of uh, 23, last year, the JADC2 Implementation Act said, yay, barely, CDAO office, you, you have responsibility to create and operate a software factory-like approach to this problem. So there's awareness. It's moving that way. We need probably more of it faster. Another one is a federated operating model, or FOM, for enterprise data management and interoperability. 
Now, you know, that's a pretty common concept if you've been around the modeling and simulation community. They've been using it for decades because you've had systems that were developed by the services. If you remember the old days of JFCOM decided they were gonna to try to build one from the ground up to be interoperable and, and then JFCOM went away and that concept went away. And so you had this routine problem of how do you get things that, that systems and networks that don't really talk the same language to work together. So they came up with this idea of the federated operating model and that's used in IT as well. And what that allows you to do for those federates, think of those as the different participants, be they networks or systems or organizations, it allows you to decentralize the data governance problem. And CJADC2, by very definition, is a, a decentralized approach. You know, the, those of us who have been around a little bit longer than some, uh, there is no such thing in the department as a fully centralized approach, with the possible exception being the last time we worked on the Oppenheimer-like projects, right? So, the Manhattan Project. So, um, it's a very difficult thing, and you have to allow those different uh, parts of the whole to do what they need to be able to do, but you need to bring them together. And a FOM provides you not just a data dictionary, but also provides you, a, a, if you will, it's sort of the working agreement for those aspects that need to be controlled, coordinated, and brought together, and those that don't, because there are going to be many of those pieces that won't necessarily play to the same extent. And then the third that I would throw out is on experimentation, test, and training environments. So, um, you know, everybody would, you know, I know Indopaycom right now is don't give me a system if I don't have time to train on it before it's before the balloon might go up. And and of course the challenge there is um, the con ops and the tactics, techniques, and procedures, keeping up with the ever changing, fast paced movement of new capabilities and trying to create something that didn't exist. None of the system merchants say that. Many of the systems today that we rely on for this idea of this all domain were never intended to be interoperable. We know that. So, so how do you create con ops and TTPs for things that were never supposed to fit together? And so taking that distributed software factory approach that I talked about earlier and, you know, standard software practice, you know, we talked about software developers sitting there with the warfighters, but, you know, typically you in, you're in one sandbox developing the code, you're in another sandbox testing it, and then there's the third sandbox so software factories can participate and tie into the existing training networks like, like the Navy's continuous training environment, like the Air Force's distributed mission operations network. And, and tie that all together so that the warfighters are really driving that direction for what they want to see for capability development. But in the end, I would say in total, it's more of all of that. So the, the department's moving that way, but like a lot of times, you know, the warfighters are kind of out in front, and, and now it's trying to get all these other things that have to happen so you can end up with the capability you can use. Excellent. Gary, thanks for taking us home. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now got a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. If you have a question, please state the question. If there's somebody that tells who you are first, state the question. And then if you have somebody you want to direct the question to, please go ahead, sir. Welcome, Sydney. Good to see you. All right. Dennis, you want to take that one? The former uh, J6? Well, since the statement was made uh, post my uh, active duty service, I don't have a lot of insight into what led the Deputy Secretary to make that evaluation. Uh, I can speculate uh, and would say that there clearly has been progress made on parts and, and pieces of this journey, uh, but I'm unaware of 
of how I would incorporate the C and J, really the fulsome of that declaration. Uh, so I would leave that to my active duty uh, partners and whatever they could offer uh, that would be insightful as to uh, the timing of that announcement. All right, Doug, uh, anything to offer on that? Sure, I mean, it, that was really, it kind of gets back to the guide and the data integration layer discussion. And, and you know, the, the concept has been demonstrated, this data centrality at the, at the COCOM level, you know, being able to move information across that battle space has been demonstrated. And that's, that's what she was referring to. Um, within Project Overmatch, you know, one of the core parts of our architecture we call literally data. And that data fabric is meant to connect with that data integration layer. And that's, that's what we mean by there are new TTPs, new means of moving information across the battle space that are um, you know, a critical enabler of, of the uh, C2 functions at, at all those levels. All right, thank you very much. Another question. Sir. Thanks for your service. I came in the 80s and I understand everything that you just talked about, but I'm not going to go back to the Ask Washington. I just got a lot of that. Of course, you just told me that I was born in this and got all this data. All we really doing is just asking for some more fight, put them in games, as you said, more ball, agile, in there, understanding the architecture so they can assimilate that back. So let me refer that question to Admiral Thomas, the former 7th Fleet Commander, because every, all of us Fleet Commanders love our battle watch captains. So if you didn't hear the question, it's, you know, with all of the discussion of CJAD C2 and, you know, the, the technical aspects of this and data and PED processing and evaluation and dissemination of information, you know, how's it going in the fleet? Carl? Yeah, so uh, clearly it's a, it's a huge challenge to get uh, all those systems to that single watch standard that has to make decisions. And that's what that's the, the goal you want to achieve is you want to give them the best information that you can so they can make the right call and get the order out to the right unit to take a particular track. It depends where we are in a conflict or whether we're in competition or crisis. Uh, you can apply this same logic at, at the competition stage to the crisis stage uh, all the way up to conflict and it probably actually gets easier as you get up in the complex stage, because once you get to the complex stage, some of the, the challenges of, of escalation, some of the challenges of understanding what really is happening get a lot clearer for you. Uh, so in the day-to-day -day competition out in the in Seventh Fleet, where we're sailing and operating anywhere international law allows, the battle watch that's sitting in my uh, Desron uh, Commodore's watch floor, or sitting on the CTF-70's watch floor, or sitting on my Seventh Fleet watch floor, or sitting on the pack fleet watch floor, all of us care about that freedom of navigation op and whether the PRC vessel is uh, gonna do something aggressive or, or not on this particular mission and competition. And how do you get that information so that we're all operating on the same plane? And what else is happening in the world that you have to bring in so you maybe can stitch things together? That's just a microcosm of what we're talking about, the amount of data that's out there. And how do you take data Fuse it, create information, and then create knowledge by being able to understand patterns. And, and how do you bring some of these battle ma management aids that we're trying to build into this architecture so that we have things helping us to make those decisions? It's a, it's a tremendously uh, challenging problem, but it's an open space that we can, we can work on. And then when you bring in the, the allies and the partners, you know, now you want to have that same knowledge to the extent you can across their battle watch commanders. And so you're working as a team. So that, that's the problem that's framed up. It's how do you take the information and put it in a usable manner so you can make those crisp decisions in a timely manner. So uh, part of my watch list for this that I think is really key to your question, and, I, and I'm a big fan of Guide. I think Guide was very insightful and gives us a great opportunity in a rapid fashion. We can iterate quickly since they, uh, the periodicity of these are, are fairly high annually. Uh, what I'm always on, that's on my watch list, is what we are not looking at, uh, what we are white carding. 
uh, because that's always the details. What we integrate, I think we tend to integrate well. And what we don't, we don't. And that don't list is bigger than the do list. Uh, and to me, that could be a very decisive feature in the outcome of anything tactically all the way up to strategically. So it's not that we're avoiding it. Uh, it's not that we uh, are hiding it. It's just difficult uh, to do it. Let me, uh, Go ahead, an Bob. another lesson that comes out of guide, which is not down at the warfighter, down at the watch captain level, if you will, but I think it's still important, is that uh, this is a partnership that, that happens between those who can deliver the technology and the way to work with the data and the capabilities and with the warfighter that has to have the processes to do it right. Uh, I will tell you that um, I, I came from the Air Force, so I watched F-4 pilots try to fly F-15s like F-4s, and then they tried to fly F-22s like F-15s. I would argue that there's probably inside the Navy F-35 pilots that are still suffering through F-18 problem sets, if you will, trying to figure out how to take that advanced technology and use it in the right way. The process matters, and, and so process will change as the technology enables it to change. And, and so therefore, what it is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a partnership between this new technology comes in and the ability to work that data in a new way demands a new process that the warfighter has to develop, not the technical guy. Thanks, Punch, I can relate. Uh, I walk, I was a commanding officer of a 688 class submarine. I walk out of Virginia and go, where's the periscope? No, we don't have one anymore. It's a photonics mast. Last question, right here. So, uh, Frank and Sean, Paradox Investigations. Um, hey, Frank, how you doing? Long time no see. Do you want to take that? I mean, I think we have tremendous flexibility, and we've actually, I mean, we've demonstrated that. I won't go into any specifics, but absolutely. And that is, that's the key of being agile and, and moving at, at speed is as things come along and you're able to uh, get them connected, get them connected. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility there. And you, you can almost view Overmatch as a platform for getting those types of e equipments integrated into, I'll say the Navy, but the Joint Force. Is, is there a customer that you can think of that would be partnering? So I, I usually drive my team crazy by saying, just get a hold of me, Douglas.small <laughs> at Navy.mil. And if you have something, I will take your meeting or I will get you connected with the teams that, that matter and we will get it working. He, he does answer these. Emails. I was out in West in San Diego, and there were vendors all over the place that had written to him, and he came to their booth to see them. I'm sure there's a lot here today, too, so if you have a question, please ask. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsor, HII, and if you would, give me a big round of applause for all these great guys up here on the stage. <laughs>